Dobr večer vsem. Welcome to Robert Faller and Mladen Dolar. We will have a talk today, Grapes of Red. Mladen Dolar wrote a short text before we began to think about this uh, festival. And today they will talk about this red anger which is among us. Mladen Dolar, you know probably very well for the people in Ljubljana, Slovenia, professor at the Faculty for Philosophy, founder of uh, Ljubljana Lekanian School, uh, writer next year. He has a new book which will be issued by Duke Press University. Um, and we are really keen to hear what they will say about the anger. And with us is Robert Faller, also a philosopher from Vienna, professor uh, in Linz. Uh, he wrote also a lot of texts. He was here in Indigo Festival about five years ago. And he's our, as I may say, a regular partner, like Mladen for, uh, for years. Um, thank you very much to everyone who will share these ideas together. And welcome uh, Robert Farrer and Mladen Dolar. Well, uh, is this on? You hear me? Okay. Um, what, what can I say? Dear Robert, <laughs> welcome back to Ljubljana. <laughs> um, you have been a regular visitor to this city for 30 years and more, I believe. I, I think in the early days, I still remember you came to my seminar as a guest uh, to the university. And then you have been the guest of, I think, the majority of cultural and, and academic institutions in this town over the years. And there has been this uh, unfortunate interruption of two and a half years. And uh, I don't know how to say, we missed you. <laughs> so it's, it's great that you're, 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 you're back in town. Um, I think you were the, um, the guest of the Indigo Festival before in 2017 and uh, at that point our biggest problem seemed to be encapsulated by the word Trump. This is what we were discussing about if I remember well five years ago. Now Trump is kind of um, not quite gone, semi, semi gone, semi gone, <laughs> but our problems have increased since. Uh, we have many more. So, one of the points of this evening is also to maybe to take stock of what happened in the last five years and how we landed in this very unhappy situation we are, we are in with multiple accumulated troubles. Um, well, um, Blas already said you're a professor at the University of Art and Industrial Design in Linz. And, uh, well, the, the phrase goes, uh, Robert Fowler needs no introduction in this city, but nevertheless, <laughs> but nevertheless, and if you read Robert's uh, work, you know that he spent a lot of reflection on this phrase, I know very well, but nevertheless. And so, but nevertheless, uh, for the sake of the form, I will nevertheless say something, and Robert is also a great believer in the form. And um, he um, he's the author of about a dozen books in German. And I must point out the, the Illusionen der Anderen in uh, 2002, The Illusions of the Others, which was uh, translated into English on the pleasure principle in culture, Illusions Without Owners, a book which appeared with Versa in 2014 and made a great, great impact. And uh, I must mention the notion of interpassivity and a book which also appeared in German and English on interpassivity. You are the inventor of this concept and uh, also of the way how this concept can be used as a sort of key to understanding, understanding culture. And um, I will mention your last books. Um, were first, the Erwachsenensprache, the adult language, which was published in 2017 and stirred quite a lot of uh, controversy. And then, uh, Die Blitzende Waffen über die Macht der Form, the shining weapons on the power of the form, which uh, 
was published in 2020. And then the book which just came out, maybe we'll touch upon it, with the somewhat enigmatic uh, title, Zwei Enthüllungen über die Scham, like two revelations about the shame. Maybe we'll come to this. It, it just came out a month or two ago. We'll, we'll come to this. Why is shame? Why is shame? Uh, such a big problem. And um, I also have to mention that there are three books actually translated into Slovene. Umazano Sveto in Čisti Um, Anelekta 2009, Interpasivnost radosti delegiranega uživanja on the joys of delegated enjoyment, which was published by Maska in 2019, and then Zakaj se splača živeti, elementi materialistične filozofije, vo fyre zih zu leben lohnt, published in 2020, what makes the life worth living? And if in the end, we run out of uh, questions and have still time. I may ask you this. Uh, as a last resort, we may come to this question like, uh, why is life worth living? What makes the life worth living? Professor Faller, could you explain this to us? Because we are losing hope with this increasing uh, doubts about this. Um, maybe if there is time, we will end. Uh, we can end with this. Um, now, I will say, uh, I mean, this is uh, basically, I'm there to introduce your talk, and uh, I will nevertheless say a couple of things. And um, the first is that um, I, I will say a couple of words on, on the novel, which is called The Grapes of Wrath, because the, the, the slogan of, the, of this year's uh, Indigo Festival is taken from this novel by John Steinbeck, Steinbeck who uh, with the novel which was uh, published in uh, 1939. And it instantly became a classic, um, hailed as a big uh, American novel. It instantly won the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, it sold 14 million copies. And uh, Steinbeck, many years later, eventually was awarded uh, the Nobel Prize in 1962. And in 1940, already, the novel was turned into a major movie directed by John Ford, starring Henry Fonda. So Hollywood also immediately seized on this. And um, the book is extraordinary. The book is extraordinary for its immediate, the immediate way it speaks to our times. Namely, the central event of the book is a major ecological catastrophe, a major ecological catastrophe which hit America in the 30s, which was at the time called the Dust Bowl. And it was a man-made catastrophe. Uh, basically, when after the First War, uh, World War, uh, agriculture was turned into an industrial branch with a lot of um, new equipment, uh, tractors and um, combined harvesters, etc., etc., they did deep plowing and uprooting the, the grass in the whole vast area of uh, the Great Plains in central in central part of America, Oklahoma, Kansas. Uh, West uh, Texas, and uh, having uprooted those, those grasses, the, those grasses actually uh, held the structure of the soil together and kept the humidity. And once they were uprooted on this grand scale with industrial agriculture, the topsoil was simply blown away. It was blown away in enormous vast quantities. There was a dust bowl. The dust covered half of America was blown away to Chicago, to, to the East Coast. There were days where they couldn't see the sun. It was the Black Sunday in 1935. And all the farmers in the whole area lost their livelihood. And they also had bank loans. They, they defaulted on the bank loans. They were evicted. And there was the massive exodus. So this is the background of this novel. And you can see the, the, this major, major ecological catastrophe at the center of this novel. And uh, Steinbeck was incredibly well aware of this. I mean, he had a friend called uh, Ed Ricketts, who was at the time ecologist, uh, marine biologist, but uh, one of the first people to raise the consciousness about the ecological disasters, the possible ecological disasters that will follow from this ruthless industrial use, use of land. Some 75% of the topsoil was blown away by the winds. 
in the period of, from 30, 34 to 39 or so. And so uh, what followed was the massive exodus of these people. Some three and a half million people from Oklahoma and the neighboring countries had to flee. In, they lost all the means of livelihood. And there's uh, this Joad family, which is the center of the story. And they went to the promised land of California. And there is a biblical subplot to the whole novel. There's the Exodus story, the Exodus from Egypt to the promised land. But what is the promised land? What, what waits for them in California? Well, there's suddenly this massive influx of, of cheap labor. And uh, this is uh, a great, the, the, the big corporations are having a great time. They can pay the lowest wages ever. They, they're paying the starvation wages. So the promised land turns into a nightmare, turns into absolute hell. So, from Exodus to the Promised Land to Apocalypse. This is the, the background of this, of this novel. And um, there is um, the plight of these migrant workers who cannot find work anywhere. One figure, uh, Jim uh, Cre Creary, sorry, um, uh, whatever his name is, uh, um, he turns into, into a sort of Christ figure, organizing the, the, the syndicates, the labor, the unions, the strikes, and on the other hand, and he's, he's then killed, he's a sort of Christ figure of the, of the story, and on the other hand, the Joad family, actually the only work they can find is his strike breakers. They, they are employed as strike breakers. Um, so the antagonism, the class antagonism, is translated into the antagonism between, two, between, the, workers, between the workers themselves. Um, I will take two quotes from this book. One I, um, I um, quoted b very briefly, but only the beginning in this uh, text uh, announcement. And uh, here is the, the whole quote. To, to somehow recall this historical moment. And this is what Steinbeck says. He says, this is the beginning, from I to we. If you, who own the things that people must have, could understand this, you might preserve yourself. If you could separate causes from results, if you could know that pain, Tom Paine, the instigator of the American Revolution, Paine, Jefferson, Marx, Lenin, where results and not causes, you might survive. But you cannot know, for the quality of owning freezes you forever into the I and cuts you off forever from the we. So what I find astounding in this, in this passage is, uh, is something that couldn't be written today, as it were. Because uh, he points his, his finger directly Look, there is private property, and private property is the cause of all this. And the private property is the cause of this I, which prevents us to be a we. And what is even more astounding is this sequence of names, Tom Paine, Marx, Jefferson, Lenin. You have two founding fathers of the American Revolution, Tom Paine, who was, uh, well, you know, the instigator of the American Revolution and then participant in the French Revolution and the author of The Rights of Man, one of the most ardent pamphlets of the, of the Enlightenment. You have Jefferson the author of the Declaration of Independence, and then in the same series you have Marx and Lenin. So what is this sentence saying? It's saying that the socialist revolution should be the continuation of the American Revolution. The American Revolution, if understood properly, should actually translate into socialist revolution. And um, this is a sort of historical reminder of the kind of discourse that was around in 1939. And John Steinbeck was not the only one, there was a whole bunch of social writers, top social writers in America at the time. There was Upton Sinclair, there was Sinclair Lewis, there was John Dos Passos, there was Theodore Dreiser, who were all socialists. And, and this is not major writers, this is really, they're not minor writers, this is a very major writer. Sinclair Lewis also won the Nobel Prize. So this was the type of discourse in April 1939. And then in September, as you know, the war started. Um, now, um, the, the Grapes of Wrath actually stems from a biblical reference from the Apocalypse, appropriately evoking the question of divine justice. 
And there is like, in the whole novel, this is sort of radical Christian communist subplot to the novel. And uh, Steinbeck uses the title phrase literally only once in the novel, in chapter 25, and I quote, and in the eyes of the hungry, there is a growing wrath. In the souls of the people, the grapes of wrath are filling and growing heavy, growing heavy for the vintage. So, what vintage? What, what vintage are these grapes of wrath ripe for? Then, and what happened since, with the accumulation of the grapes of wrath in a very different form, but maybe more massively around than ever before. And also, and this is the last uh, quote from Steinbeck, this is what he said about his novel, I wanted to put a tag of shame on the greedy bastards who are, res uh, who are responsible for this great depression. So the question of shame, which is the subject of uh, Robert's last book, you have wrath and shame. The question of shame looms, looms large. And maybe we'll come, we'll come to this in the discussion. What is the, what is the fate of shame, of shaming, which defines so much of our culture at this point? And then, uh, this is one thing I want to say, and there is a second thing. I will reiterate something that I keep, keep telling. <laughs> I think uh, already uh, last year when I was here with uh, Nina Power, I already mentioned this. And uh, I keep bringing this up, and this is also in this announcement. The question of uh, this accumulation of an excess, of an affective excess, it, which defines the, the present moment. Is there an end of capitalism in sight? Well, we have been waiting for this for 150 years since Marx's predictions, and it seems that capitalism has this incredible resilience that any opposing force can be recuperated, can be integrated into the inner force of capitalism itself. So there's this incredible capacity of recuperating every excess, every surplus, and making it into the inner fuel of the capitalist development. And... Uh, Nevertheless, there is a, a surplus which is produced, a surplus excess which is produced, which cannot be quite integrated and recuperated any longer. And one can see this in one way with the ecological crisis, when the amount of waste which has accumulated threatens to derail the whole machinery in unpredictable ways. And there is parallel to this and this is the thing we will be concentrating on, there's an affective surplus, affective excess, which shows itself in these two different forms. The forms of depression, and depression is the most widespread uh, pandemic around, far bigger than COVID. So uh, there's the depression, the, the tiredness, the exhaustion. And exhaustion is not quite the same thing as tiredness, because if one is tired, then one would have to rest, and well, one is not able to do all the possibilities which are offered. But exhaustion means that the, possi the possibilities have been exhausted. There are no more possibilities. We are exhausted. Huh? This is the point of exhaustion. And uh, so this is one part, depression, exhaustion, tiredness, burnout. And then there is the other part, which is the wrath, the fury, the rage, the anger, which is accumulating. Both those things are accumulating. And both those things are the results of the development of neoliberalism. Both those things which may have been, which were around before in various forms. But in this concentrated form, in this pandemic form, they're the results of the last decades of the development, the affective counterpart to the development of neoliberalism. And we're not speaking about personal afflictions or ailments, but of a necessary, socially necessary effects, a socially necessary form of effects. And depression and rage are the same thing, the active and passive expression of the same state of affairs. 
The depression is rage which is stuck in the throat and therefore immobilizes and paralyzes people. And then there is the inchoate rage which is trying to find an outlet and, 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 and one of the great problems of our times is that the one outlet it can find is actually the one outlet which is offered is the new development of populisms. The populisms actually channel and then use, fuel that rage, that wrath. But not for uh, what one consider uh, a political agenda. There is no political agenda. Political agenda is uh, make America great again, or I don't know, Forza Italia. Uh, completely empty slogans. There's no political agenda. So all this is, is fueled for an anti-politics, a systematic anti-politics, which is one of the, and, and this is one of the great uh, predicaments of the left at this point. The, the, capacity, the capacity of the left to offer a political agenda, to come back to doing proper politics, to believe in one's own politics, and uh, not to allow this, um, this free-floating rage which is around to be used by the populist agendas which are growing. And I will just recall that in October we will celebrate the 100th anniversary, celebrate is not the word, there will be the 100th anniversary of the Marcia su Roma, the March on Rome, Mussolini's March on Rome, which was somehow marked by this ludicrous repetition, as it were, in last week's elections in, in Italy. And yes, we both come from the aftermath of 68. We both come from a certain period when radical change seemed to be in the air and was possible. We both come from Althusser and Lacan and the, the, the whole French theory which uh, fueled our imagination, our work is still, is still doing this. So I don't know, but the question is, one of the questions is, how the hell did we get, get here from that time? And I'll, I'll pass you the word. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mladen. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm really pleased by this and honored by this enormous attendance here. I'm very happy. Thank you very much, Blas, for the kind invitation again to the wonderful Inigo Festival. And thank you, Mladen, so much for this oh, lovely and wonderful introduction. <clears throat> I wanted to tackle the issue of the grapes of wrath uh, with regard to a specific word, which is, to my knowledge, very widespread in the English-speaking world and in the German-speaking world. I do not know how this is uh, here, uh, but all these problems are currently in German and in English coined under the formula of hate. So uh, my approach uh, is thus to uh, ask the question, where does the gain in hate come from? <clears throat> At first sight, one may get the impression that hate is everywhere today, that it's downright a mark of our time. Symptomatically, since a few years, the word hate has become a most frequently used word. In its overwhelming simplicity, this word is used when it comes to violent acts, stalkings, threats, use of swear words, shit storms, mean postings, cruel commenting or defriending people on the social media, or also practices of shaming, for example, fat shaming, body shaming, etc. In the remaining world outside of the social media, people hate, for example, SUVs or people who use them. They hate people who use airplanes or plastic or are still wrapping their gifts. Some hate old white men 
others hate morals or people who hate them. Some even hate themselves for hating other people, etc. <clears throat> In the face of such developments, the notion of hate has gained an almost unquestioned prominence from everyday language to ceremonial Sunday speeches, for example, German writer Caroline Emke, and programmatical political statements, German member of parliament Renate Künast, hate is not an opinion, up to the language of theory, for example, Judith Butler, excitable speech. Thus, one may feel urged to ask oneself how this has come about, and if it is true that compared to other decades, our epoch has miraculously succeeded to produce some sort of increased wrath, a kind of surplus hate. Now, my first claim here is that the notion of hate is not particularly apt to account for these phenomena. And my second claim is that it is precisely the poor aptitude of this notion that is the reason for its success. As it seems to me, there is a slight air of comedy to this. I am most optimistic to get well understood here, since, as I know, Ljubljana is not just a stronghold, but probably even the world's capital of comedy theory, thanks to the contributions of Naden Dola, Alenka Supancic, Slavoj Žižek, Jela Krejčić, Ivana Novak, Gregor Moda, and many others. As you all probably know, tragedy presents precisely the hero's strength as the cause of their failure. Whereas in comedy, it's the other way around, it is the hero's ill-preparedness for their purpose that becomes the cause of their success. In this sense, I regard the notion of hate as the comedy hero of our time. Due to its simple-mindedness, as well as its innocent infantility, comparable to the currency of like in social media, the hate has made it up to the highest ranks of the Western intelligentsia and its political class. <clears throat> There's one key simplification brought about by the notion of hate. This simplification consists in the fact that hate does not allow to discern between, on the one hand, hostile actions or utterances, and on the other hand, certain angry feelings that are either necessarily or under certain circumstances uh, bringing about such actions and utterances. The notion of hate thus seduces us to assume that wherever we observe a hostile outburst, there must also be some angry feeling or disdainful opinion behind it, deeply rooted within the person that carries out an aggression. Behind every phenomenon of a certain kind, there must be a corresponding emotional capacity. This idea may, may remind one of the famous doctor in Moliere's comedy, the doctor who discerns behind someone that is falling asleep, a human capacity, a vis dormitiva capacity for sleeping. <clears throat> English language appears particularly apt for providing such simplifications, words whose function can be compared to that of military flashbangs, weapons directed at making oneself invisible to the enemy by temporarily blinding him. These words, hate, for example, by their blinding evidence, obfuscate a theoretical problem. As a comparison, just let me remind you of the word labor and the role it once played in political economy. The key function of this notion of labor was not to draw a distinction between, on the one hand, the actual performance that leads to a product, and on the other hand, the capacity for that very performance embodied in the person of the worker. It required the sharp eye of Karl Marx, with his training in Aristotelian philosophy, to introduce this distinction, the distinction between labor and the labor power, just as between Aristotle's concepts of energeia and dynamis. 
only by introducing this distinction, it became possible to see that the value of the done productive work was not the same as the value of the labor power that consists of the done work of reproduction. Thus, it became possible to give an answer to the question that had remained unresolved until then, precisely the question where does in economy the surplus value come from. Maybe we should proceed in an analogous way with the notion of hate. We should then distinguish between committed acts of aggression on the one hand and the latent capacity of aggressiveness on the other. This distinction would allow us to see if we are currently facing a production of surplus hate, and if so, we might even be, tell, uh, we might even be able to tell where it comes from. Only this distinction between aggressive acts and aggressiveness enables us to formulate questions such as, do acts of aggression always stem from a previously latent aggressiveness that has become manifest? And vice versa, does aggressiveness always and necessarily lead to acts of aggression? Psychoanalysis has a clear position with regard to these questions, as you probably all know here in the world's capitalism, capital of Lacanianism. According to Jacques Lacan, aggressiveness is a human condition. It stems from the ambivalent relationship to one's own mirror image, a relationship that later repeats itself in the relationships that we entertain with our role models and rivals. Those ideal models have got the advantage to provide us with an unexpected positive image of our own wholeness and perfection, but this advantage comes at a price for these images inevitably alienate us. We then do not bear our perfection in ourselves. We are now, as it were, not anymore masters in this house of our newly gained identity, but instead inevitably mediated through something or someone foreign. And that threatens us with the horrible fantasy of a fragmentation of our own body in case that we should once fall from the grace of our alienation. Yet not only this problematic emergence of our ideal ego is a source of aggressiveness in the human condition, also the mere existence of an outer world as such has to be taken into account as a considerable source of displeasure. According to Sigmund Freud, I quote, the original meaning of hating is the relation to the alien and stimulating outside world, end of quote. So according to psychoanalytic theory, already in our most basic elementary psychic equipment, we can call an enormous capacity of aggressiveness our own. This does not exclude, of course, that there are not later contingent historical experiences and acquisitions which even add to this human equipment of aggressiveness. As opposed to more optimistic depiction of the human condition, psychoanalysis thus portraits us as profoundly aggressive beings from our very start. Yet the good news that psychoanalysis can deliver is that this aggressiveness does not necessarily or automatically express itself in acts of aggression. Quite on the contrary, this initial aggressiveness becomes necessarily subject to a number of considerable revisions and reworkings. For example, the revisions of reaction formations. Freud remarks, I quote, that the childhood pre-existence of strong bad impulses often becomes the very condition for a particularly clear turn to the good in the adult. The strongest childish egoists can become the most helpful and self-sacrificing citizens, most compassion enthusiasts, philanthropists, animal rights activists have developed from little sadists and animal tormentors." End of quote. Such reversals into the contrary are not only sometimes the unexpected sources of loving attitudes and act of love. Following Freud, one could probably even state that the typical surplus of love, compared, for example, to the more normal amounts of sympathy or friendship, 
that the surpluses of love always stem from an amount of hatred that has been added to the love. Love owns its intensity to the innocent arithmetics of the unconscious that does not know any contradiction or rather any negative measures, but instead just adds up the amount of effect, whatever that direction may be, to one single summation. Whereas a small insult by a friend forces us to cons consciously subtract a minor amount of anger from a bigger amount of sympathy, in love, on the contrary, the insult even contributes to the unconscious addition of affection. Small gifts may thus maintain a friendship. Love, instead, seems to require a constant influx of minor insults. In common sense, this paradoxical finding of Freud is well known. A beginning love often announces itself in a number of small hostilities between two people. Thus, colleagues at the workplace, for example, are often earlier able to guess that they are observing the beginning of love than the lovers themselves are able to. <clears throat> If aggressiveness may thus be, according to psychoanalysis, a kind of fundamental disposition, it has to be stated, in the words of Louis Althusser, that the lonely hour of this last instance never comes. Instead, since this original aggressive condition is subject to revisions and reworkings, it requires specific cultural and historical condition for aggressiveness to come through in the form of acts of aggression. We have to remind ourselves here of the beautiful lines by Bertolt Brecht. I quote my English translation here, Brecht. On my wall hangs a Japanese wooden work, mask of an evil demon painted with gold lacquer. Compassionately, I see the swollen forehead veins suggesting how exhausting it is to be evil. End of quote. What first may have appeared like self-evident as a natural consequence from the existence of such a basic human equipment of aggressiveness now presents itself as a theoretical problem. How is it possible that this aggressiveness is sometimes apparently not subject to reworkings, but instead breaks through apparently uninhibited? What are the specific disinhibiting forces provided by certain cultures or societies as opposed to others? Can it be that aggressiveness sometimes even gets encouraged and increased by forces of culture, for example, religion? One may recall here the brilliant remark by theoretical physicist Steven Meinberg, who stated that, I quote, with or without religion, good people can behave well and bad people can do evil. But for good people to do evil, that takes religion, end of quote. <laughs> <laughs> if it is true that aggressiveness does not automatically translate itself into acts of aggression, we may feel encouraged to ask the opposed question. Do acts of aggression necessarily require aggressiveness? Is every hostility to be seen as like the juicy grape of some deep inner feeling of wrath? A lovely answer to this question has recently been provided by the Austrian writer Michael Köhlmeier in his no novel Brother and Sister Le Noble. In this very Viennese novel, a psychoanalyst who has until then only innocently contributed to the internet with small scholarly remarks on Wikipedia, one day learns from his analysand that on the same internet you can also write anonymously by using one or several pseudonyms. And if you use a proxy server, whatever you write cannot be traced back to you. This new perspective excites and seduces the psychoanalyst. And all of a sudden, he indulges in the filthy joy of posting most nasty and hostile comments. If one of his aliases already commence with remarkable cruelty, his next alias enters into a dialogue with the previous by even outdoing the first in its utter evilness and so on. 
the multitude of his pseudonyms alone, allow, alone shows itself able to constitute a whole threat of real wrath in the virtual world. What drives the analyst to do this is obviously not an explosion of some deeply rooted hatred. Instead, it is the framework of the so-called social media that disinhibits this psychoanalyst. Just like the dream or also the setting of the psychoanalytic clinic itself, just the liberating sense of not being liable allows for and produces utterances of ultimate recklessness. As soon as things are allowed to float freely, they seem to float automatically down the drain into the filth. It is not his aggressiveness that comes to the fore here, since it is not even he who is speaking or writing. Just, irresponsibly, just irresponsibility itself gets released here and enjoys itself. Just as the filth of some of our dreams assures us of the fact that the dream is a dream, so also the apparent hate functions as a kind of reminder of the fact that this discourse is, is by its very nature fictitious, even if it is able, of course, to produce effects in the real world. As Marshall McLuhan has rightly put it, the medium is the message here and its messenger and not anybody else. This double finding that our essential aggressiveness is not a sufficient condition for being aggressive and that aggressions can well exist and be produced without aggressiveness may help us to find an answer to the question why so-called hate appears to play such a prominent role in our contemporary world or at least in its self-perception. Where does the apparent surplus of hostility stem from? For example, when in so-called reality TV shows, like in the legendary American Jerry Springer show, people start smashing up the cars of their unfaithful spouses in front of the camera and fill them with garbage. Or when in some TV documentation in Austria, visitors of a provincial club disco reveal their incredible rudeness and vulgarity. We should never forget here that these people, instead of acting as if nobody looked, act in this way precisely because they feel observed. Feeling observed, they feel obliged to serve this gaze and to be entertaining, extreme and worth of attention and curiosity. Psychoanalytically speaking, one could say these people who feel observed act under transference. They try to play a role in a film which is not their own. This becomes even stronger when the gaze they feel upon themselves is perceived as a gaze of contempt or disdain. If already the observing other contributes an amount of transference by projecting upon his objects an expectation of their inferiority in terms of manners or morals, then this initial transference stemming from the observation is answered by counter-transference. The visitors of the provincial club may be right to feel that the urban TV team regards them as beasts and primitives. And then they start to present themselves as beasts and primitives, a gesture that at the same time expresses an acknowledgement of their expected inferiority as well as a protest against that expectation and that inferiority. This is what Stephen Greenblatt has beautifully analyzed in his seminal essay, Filthy Rights. There, Greenblatt shows when, for example, colonizers regard the colonized indigenous people as barbarians, the latter all of a sudden begin to behave as barbarians and even far more barbarously than the observers would have expected. The observed may start, for example, to eat excrements before their eyes, etc. Events that in the more recent history of our culture may have found their equivalent in certain performances of the well-known group of Viennese actionists such as Günter Bruce, Otto Mühl, Oswald Wiener and others around 1968. Whenever in our culture we encounter something utterly primitive or barbaric, we should never forget this lesson of Stephen Greenblatt. These disgusting things do not happen out of themselves. 
they are products of their observation and of the experienced differences in class or social prestige that are involved in this observation. This is precisely what the notion of hate makes invisible, obfuscates, by assuming that aggression would be the same or correspond to an aggressiveness in the same person, such as his toxic masculinity, for example. Yet this aggression is not to be located in the acting person. It is at least as much the product of this person's observation. This primitive other is nothing but the product of his othering by the gaze that looks upon him from above and with contempt. Today's astonishment about hate and the alleged primitive, uh, the alleged primitivity of certain people is therefore to be understood as the typical astonishment of the cultural elites who forget about the efficacy that their own gaze exerts upon its objects. This is the mark of an epoch that tried to understand itself as that of an end of history, the final triumph of a neoliberalist capitalist world order and of the corresponding post-politics that assumed all social conflicts to be resolved and limited itself to the mere administration of things. This is nicely described and analyzed in a recently published book with the title The End of the End of Politics by Alex Hochuli, George Hoare, and Philip Kanleif. I suspect that these authors owe quite a lot to some authors here in Slovenia. The agents and profiteers of these post-politics pursued, as the authors show, they pursued a culturalization as well as a miniaturization of social problems. Social problems were thus reduced, for example, to the choice of the right words and gestures. And any conflict was seen as stemming from pure prejudice, such like such as racism or sexism or whatever. As Hochuli, Hoare, and Kanlaf point out, any passion in politics got thus condemned by the post-political liberal regime, as if people did not have any reasons to be angry. Significantly, we feel disgusted when confronted what, with what we call fanat fanaticism, and we forget, as Alberto Toscano has recently pointed out, that this, what we today call fanaticism, was once seen as a revolutionary virtue referred to by the normal name of enthusiasm. Obviously, the elites were better off in this political post-political business. They knew better how to use the words that didn't harm anybody, and they felt more sensitively what were the harmful words and things. In this way, suffering and its recognition were distributed upward to the elites, while the blame for it moved downward to the uneducated masses. The elites use nice words and they do not hate, so they appear to be free from aggressiveness, even if they exert the most massive deprivations and impoverishments upon the rest of society. For example, when the super rich manage to double their fortunes in the two years of the COVID crisis, according to the Oxfam report. This has to be seen as a real aggression and as can easily be noticed, again, it does not require any aggressivity. <clears throat> the Austrian philosopher Günther Anders has perspicuously analyzed these developments already shortly after the Second World War. In his programmatic essay on the antiquity of hating, the Antiquiertheit des Hasses, Anders points out that already since the earliest 20th century, most of our aggressions do not need any previous aggressivity. It suffices to start the aggression and aggressivity will follow just as according to the French proverb, the appetite will come when eating. La petite vient en mangeant. And one can say, since it is exhausting, and unpleasant to be evil, one can even start hating one's victim precisely for hating it. Just as one can love to love somebody, as Dana Summer once put it, one can also hate to hate somebody, 
So also the effect of hate against somebody can become reflexive and nourish its intensity from itself. Anders mentions the fact that already at the time of the First World War, in some garrison cities of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, there existed the saying of the kind artillerists. Artillery men were proverbially nice people since they were able to kill their enemies without seeing them. Killing has thus, as Anders emphasizes, ceased to be fighting. Instead, it has become work. Long before the use of drones, the killing of an enemy had become an occupation comparable to the elimination of a typo from a manuscript. Faced with the choice, Anders remarks, he would find hating without killing better than the other way around. When it comes to hate, the predicament of our time appears to lie in the fact that aggressiveness and aggression are completely torn apart and distributed to two different camps or classes. Just as in capitalism, the labor power and the means of production are on different separated sides. Anders remarks, it is precisely the lack of hatred, the inability of our instruments to hate, it is precisely this defect from which we will perish. End of quote. Instead of being appalled by what we call hate, instead of condemning aggressiveness, we should probably rather try to reconnect it with the aggression that got separated from it. If we ever succeed not to perish, as Anders puts it, it will be precisely due to this, that we have successfully given aggression back to aggressivity and that we have succeeded to direct aggressivity against that which deserves aggression. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. That went in many directions, and yes, connected with uh, something as I said. Um, maybe I would ask a question about the social media and uh, the form of social media and the particular way that uh, hatred is generated, also by the anonymity of the social media, but also by the gaze. Whose, whose gaze is it? And I think this is this is a basic problem in social media that mm -hmm. uh, in. If you have a classic uh, medium like television, then some people are on television and the vast majority is watching them. Mm -hmm. Very few are on television and all the rest are watching. Whereas in, with the internet and particularly with social media, everybody is an actor and, uh, and an audience. Everybody produces and uh, at the same time consumes so the, the very difference between the spectator and the actor is collapsed in some sense. Who, who, is, who is it that watches? Whom? Who watches whom? I mean, there, there is a conundrum. There's an enigma to this. I mean, this is massively, we are all spectators and we are all actors in this. And so this is one of the big divides which has, I mean, I think this is a, a new thing with the social media. Mm -hmm. And social media, a very recent phenomenon. I mean, they, they, this is like 15 years, 2005, I think, Facebook started, 2010, Instagram. This is incredibly recent. And uh, now everybody is producer, everybody is a spectator in this, in this world, in this strange world, in which I don't participate, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just uh, trying to understand the... The, the, the massive shift in parameters that this has, this mm -hmm. has produced because uh, the public life, so much of the public life has actually moved there. And which means that the, there's a difference, the, the very difference between public and private has collapsed, which was one of the great uh, achievements of, of, of the Enlightenment. I mean, the public use of reason. Mm -hmm. And here suddenly you have everything's public, everything's private. 
uh, the government business is conducted on the privately owned platforms whose algorithms are completely obscure. Um, and nevertheless, uh, you have governments, you have Twitter presidency. After the Twitter presidency, somehow nothing is quite, quite the same. So this, um, I, I think the specific question is who, who is watching whom and under whose gaze, for whose gaze this is produced, this, this, uh, this ag aggressivity, this uh, appearance of aggress aggressivity, the, the potential of aggressivity that you're describing if you link it to the yeah. form of the social media. Yes, yes. Well, in the first place, one has to state that this structure is precisely of what leftist media theorists since Brecht have been dreaming of. Already with sure. the radio, they thought yeah, that sure. might become possible and that would be a kind of democratic revolution. And they could not imagine that this could also lead to what you rightly addressed as the, the liquidation of this difference between public and private at the cost of the public. This is the, the crucial point. Slavoj Žižek has pointed this out very nicely, that in this, if you liquidate the difference, it is the public sphere that suffers. So it is what Richard Sennett has described as the public man as a condition for democracy or, or citizenship, that you leave all your peculiarities behind and start acting and speaking as a reasonable being and addressing the other as the same. Uh, that is being destroyed. Now, I think maybe in one point I would disagree a little bit. I suspect that the people who publish there are actually pretty few. So when I read these postings, it's even always the same suspects that come back. So in Viennese standard, you have Little Kisser 22 and Bussi Bear 91. And, uh, so uh, they always come back. And, uh, and if it is true that, like with the psychoanalyst, the same person uses a plurality of, of pseudonyms, then the group that publishes these hate postings is actually pretty small. And I suspect the majority of us is rather observing than producing in, in this space, if at all. Um, what could be done to, to di redirect this into a kind of more democratic or um, uh, into a direction that would maybe somehow re-establish a kind of public sphere and a, a rational discourse here. I mean, in the first place, I think, again, it is not so much the question who is gazing, but rather the fact that the acting people feel the need to be entertaining for this gaze. And this in, creates all this colorful life of hate or obscenity or whatever. Uh, Secondly, I think uh, what is absolutely seducing people into this, uh, in, 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 into this madness is the fact of the instantaneity of the medium. You, you write the first thing that comes to your mind, the first stupid idea that you can somehow think of, and immediately you can uh, write it down and, and post it. Psychoanalytically, we should not overlook the fact that when people utter obscene and, and disgusting things, there's also always a certain desire involved like to spit it out. You know, you don't want to have the ugly opinion in your own mouth. You spit it out and maybe somebody else believes it in your place and you are free from it. So um, whenever we hear people uttering silly or disgusting things, we should not too much like essentialistically uh, address them as the authors of this opinion. We should always give them a chance to regard what they said as spit out and not take care of it anymore. Um, and I think what would allow maybe to somehow re-civilize this would be a couple of very simple measures. For example, I would suggest for the newspapers uh, to introduce a small time gap. You can immediately write a posting, but it will not be immediately published. But like after 48 hours, you get a reminder, do you really want this to be published? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I suspect that most people would refrain from it. It's already spit out. <laughs> the... yeah, yeah. Very simple idea. <laughs> I should suggest to the, to the newspapers to introduce this. Um, yes, well, I mean, this touches upon a, a larger 
I mean, you said very few people write the uh, hate, uh, anonymous hate uh, things, and I'm sure that this is probably true. But uh, look at the, the whole production of Facebook and Instagram. I mean, I, I rather, I was rather thinking of that, mm -hmm. that everybody is a producer and a consumer mm -hmm. all the time, constantly mm -hmm. being producer and consumer. That this is, this is changing the very parameters of how public life functions. And indeed, the, when internet appeared, and with, also with the rise of new media, this was a, a sort of a dream of the left. This was an emancipatory medium. Anybody can get in connection with anybody else in the world through internet. Isn't that a utopia we've been dreaming about? Everybody has the, uh, any information at the tips of their fingers. Any information is instantly available. Again, isn't this the sort of uh, the dream of the Dross Encyclopedia? Maybe come true that fi finally we have a universal encyclopedia that everybody can consult at any time. No? And the the problem that arises is that um, I, I formulate try to formulate this uh, um, a few times. Like the, the more there is information, less there is knowledge. Mm -hmm. So the, the, there is a huge difference between information and knowledge. Mm -hmm. the, and the, the information becomes the buzz of information, which mm -hmm. actually prevents the creation of knowledge. And uh, all these things, the difference between public and private, and um, have, would have to be re-established in order for the production of knowledge to be possible. And uh, one of the major divides that, which is uh, uh, being collapsed in, 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 this, in this world is the, 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 the divide between knowledge and opinion. Mm -hmm. and anything can count as everything is leveled. Everything is on the same level. Knowledge is opinions, well-founded, substantiated, or completely unsubstantiated uh, conspiracy theories. <coughs> right. Well, if I look a bit at the discussions that go on also in the more traditional media, um, there have been two points that have somehow <coughs> excuse me, uh, astonished me. If we, I don't know, I think here in Slovenia you are really on a lucky point. Uh, you, as I learned, you had more than two camps in the COVID debate, for example. This is ingenious. I don't know any other place in the world where you had more than two camps. Me. But maybe, maybe it's for the gaze of the outsiders. Yeah, we are yes. this happy. <laughs> You're just making land. us happy here. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. But, but what is stunning in a way, um, uh, you know, in, in, in the German speaking world, for example, in the COVID debate, uh, you had two camps, obviously composed of rational people with very good arguments, mediocre people with mediocre arguments, and, and total mad people with, with crazy arguments, but probably on both sides. No? Could, could hardly be otherwise. But the interesting point is that in this whole debate, there was a swear word only available for one camp. Uh, those who criticized the measures were uh, conspiracy theorists or, or even uh, Bribless or whatever. And now I think in, with the Ukrainian crisis, which is a complete ma difficult matter as well, where you have, again, in Austria at least, two camps. Um, uh, you have rational people, <coughs> mediocre and, and crazy people in both camps. But again, there's only a swear word for one camp, like the Putin understanders. No? Uh, and I think this is a dangerous situation. And, and I would, uh, in order to if the question is how can we re-establish a public space, uh, I think uh, we should really abstain from these swear words that are available only for one camp. I think this is absolutely destroying the debates in this camp. And if I follow my own uh, conspiracy theory, uh, I have also the opinion that certain right-wing parties play an in enormously affirmative role in this game since, for example, in Austria, in the COVID crisis and in the Ukrainian crisis, only the right-wingers had 
the camp of the opposing opinion. No, but no other voice was available. There was no leftist voice that would also criticize uh, these things, as well as, for example, in Austria with the EU debate. No leftist voice critical of the European Union available. I think here in Slovenia you are, again, better off. But in Austria, this is the case. And my conspiracy theory, if I for once apply this term again, is the idea that the right-wingers play an although apparently critical, they play this incredibly affirmative role of, by uttering crazy criticisms, they discredit the whole field of criticism. Whenever you say something reasonable against something, you are immediately called, you are a right wing, you, you are you're like Freedom Party, and you cannot say it again. No? You are immediately attributed to their camp. So that is, again, the structure that destroys public debate at the moment, I think. Yes, um, I would like to. I would like, nevertheless, to come to the uh, topic of your book on, on shame because mm -hmm. it's it's connected. The question of uh, hatred you raised, and uh, what you describe in your book is this culture of shaming, uh, which is um, a sort of very very widespread uh, culture. And I don't know how to, to, to put it very naively, is shame a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> <laughs> is it, uh, is it, sh should we get rid of shame or should we keep up the structures which keep shame in place? Mm -hmm. And you, you see what I mean, because there's one line, a one postmodern line who says, uh, there's nothing to be ashamed of. Be yourself. Mm -hmm. no? mm -hmm. you, shouldn't be, you shouldn't be ashamed. There's no reason to be ashamed. I mean, just uh, follow your inner, whatever, nature, impulses. Your, ident your true identity will come up shamelessly. Mm -hmm. no? um, and then there is um, the other line, um, you know, that Lacan, in, 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 in the ending of his seminar, the four discourses, actually, he speaks about uh, the question of shame brings up the question of shame, and uh, he coins this, uh, this uh, excellent pun in French, which is ontologie, you know, like ontology, but with, spelled with an H, because la honte in French is shame. So hont not ontology, but, but uh, sh shameology, as it were. So combining the ontological questions with the questions of, of shame. And in the end of this, uh, of this um, uh, session, he actually says, if you, if you come back to me in such big numbers at this seminar, and this has always been a mystery to me why you come back at this, is very difficult, you know, it's incomprehensible. Like, huh? So, and, and he says, uh, maybe it's because I'm making you a little bit ashamed. Um, so he somehow assumes the, the role, uh, the mission of um, fulfilling this role of the big other which is gone in these shameless, shameless times. Nobody is ashamed of anything. One can shamelessly some, somehow um, come up with any kind of obscenity. And we've seen this in the great places of power. Uh, so to reintroduce the, the, some function of the big other to make people a little bit, a little bit, says, at least a little bit ashamed. <laughs> so the, 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 there is a positive function of, of of shame. So the, you, you have those, those two things. First, uh, uh, there's no reason to be ashamed. Uh, I, I can be myself, be yourself. And, but second, this translates also into, but the other should be ashamed. Mm -hmm. uh, I am the other who can tell the others to be ashamed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm the one who can... Uh, Distribute the, distribute the shame and, and, and direct it at, at particular people who are there very, in a very real world. I mean, the real world of social media, socially excluded. So it has real, very real consequences. Right. Yes. Okay. Right. <clears throat> well, maybe to start with, uh, let me just recall a quote from the ancient philosopher Diogenes, you know, the one who lived partly in a barrel. Uh, once he saw a young man blushing, getting red in his face, he shouted, courage, young man, this is the color of virtue. So in this sense, he recalled that shame is not such a bad thing. But he did not say there's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, I think the 
current use of the notion of shame in our culture has very similar reasons as the current use of the notion of hate. The same misunderstanding is uh, provided by this simple notion because it does not distinguish between an inner involuntary feeling of shame that maybe uh, no other may notice, but I can feel it, and on the other hand, the fact that other people see something in me that they disapprove of and accuse me of. This is in the English-speaking world totally confused, and uh, this dates back, I think, to even to an error committed by the American anthropologists, Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead in the 1930s and 40s, when they uh, introduced this very productive and good distinction between shame cultures and guilt cultures. I think it is true that we can make this distinction that some cultures in their moral principles are regulated by the feeling of guilt, whereas other cultures are more regulated by the feeling of shame. But what the Americans uh, misunderstood was that they said, if we are feeling guilty, we follow the inner voice of our conscience. Whereas when we are ashamed, we just follow what other people see in us or what they judge, what their judgments are about us. So they stated guilt is inner directed, shame is outer directed. And I think this was a, a, a fundamental error that, that can still be read in the humanities today. Shame is outer directed and it's just what the other people see in us. And this is also what somehow fires this whole activism that is again an old idea of the left that if we shame big companies for spilling oil into the seas, then they will refrain of it. Sometimes it worked, but then it turned out the, the capacity of shaming somebody publicly is in a way monopolized and is not very democratically distributed. So this shaming practice is not so much anymore a flag of the left. But the key error of the anthropologists was to not to carefully look at the point when shame breaks out. What is the point when shame breaks out? This is, I think, the crucial question. They assumed that shame breaks out when, for example, I have some stain on my jacket and you all see it, and at that very moment shame breaks out, that I see that you see the stain on my jacket and then shame unavoidably is exploding. But actually, this is not true. The moment that shame breaks out is not the moment that others learn of some shameful thing, but the moment that shame breaks out is the moment when it becomes impossible for you to act as if my stain didn't exist. This is the solidary dimension of shame. Shame cultures always act with this principle. If something shameful occurs, we all have to act as if it didn't exist. And only when that is made impossible, shame breaks out in a culture. This is clearly described in this little fairy tale by Anderson, the emperor's new clothes. No, of course the people know that the emperor is naked, but they all act as if that were not the case. And only the child that doesn't understand this adult rule that one has to act as if, the child uh, tells the truth. It's not because the child is smarter than the adults, it's just because the adults are doing this as if. And that, of course, involves the theoretical problems that the anthropologists were not able to solve. If we all know and still we act as if, then it is the question, of course, for whom do we act as if, if we all know. No? And I think only psychoanalysis can give an answer to this tricky problem. If we all still act as if and nobody is there that whom, whom we can deceive, then it is not anybody else for which we do this theater but it is actually an internal agency of observation, just like the superego. Psychoanalysis knows that we observe ourselves from the inside, but we have different agencies of such observation. Superego reads our innermost desires and thoughts and wishes, but there's another agency that reads just how things look, and that is the internal agency of shame 
we could call it the under ego that looks how things look and if they are lo looking strange or funny or disgusting, then this observer is disappointed when it learns it. But this observer cannot learn it as long as we act as if it didn't exist because this observer only cares for appearances and as long as we can maintain the appearance, uh, this observer uh, cannot notice it. So this was the crucial problem and I think uh, what psychoanalyst Octave Manoni, you have mentioned him already before, has developed this idea that we have a lot of illusions where we act as if, although we all know that uh, this is not true, uh, for example, in the rituals of politeness, uh, that here we are somehow uh, acting for an internal agency uh, of observation that, and this is paradoxical, only cares for outer appearances, but it's an internal observer. And that, I think, is the answer also for the question that you implied, if we are a shame culture, because if we always talk about shame, and for example, if the key question is, doesn't somebody have to disappear from the internet or from the stage, or uh, does a monument not have to be removed? It very much looks as if we were a shame culture, because this is the key issue in shame. Something has to disappear, something has to go away. This is a key difference from guilt, where always something has to come. No? If you haven't paid enough, you're in guilt, you have to pay more. If you haven't worked enough, you have to compensate by extra work and so on. So in guilt, you always have to deliver and to add something. Whereas in shame, you always have to remove mostly yourself. No? Uh, but uh, I think that is, in a way, the misunderstanding that the Americans coined, and they also still prolonged with this notion of shaming, where they assume that uh, disapprovement of others and the feeling of shame are one and the same. And I think this is not at all the case. And uh, the proof why we are not a shame culture can be seen by the fact that we are constantly pointing with fingers to somebody else. You should be ashamed, as you said, and this is not typical for shame cultures. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Japanese culture, for example, they are very careful not to ashamed anybody. Huh? If you are in Tokyo, for example, and you ask somebody for the way and you say, excuse me, uh, is uh, the, the subway to Shinjuku leaving from that track, the other will not say no. The other will say, yes, you can use that track. Uh, takes eight hours. You can also use this track. Takes 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but he will never say no, because that would shame you. Yeah? So shame cultures are very careful not to shame the other. And I think this is, in a way, the political lesson that can be drawn from it, that shame involves an obligation to solidarity. And this is completely overlooked in this shaming uh, that is completely desolidarizing and using shame as a weapon of desolidarization. Yes. Uh, they said an hour and a half, and uh, th this has uh, uh, very quickly we arrived there. So I think this is the point where we open the floor for discussion and any questions. Guce, Clele sunt microfonii. Okay, why is, is life worth living? Well, the title is not... Ah, why is the life uh, worth yes, living? Uh, no, I, was, uh, I was saving uh, this for the end, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we uh, might as well address it now. <laughs> Well, the title of my book is not Why is Life Worth Living? Which what makes the life worth living? Yeah, so it, I, saying what, why is life worth living would, would mean first, life is worth living, and second, this is the reason why. No? And, and it doesn't work like this. Um, it's often, you know, of course, when you ask a philosopher a crucial question, the philosopher doesn't give an answer but starts analyzing the question. But, uh, but I think here it is actually the case that you cannot proceed otherwise. Um, I was raising this question not in order to give an answer to it, but I was raising that question at the very moment, you know, when we were flooded with uh, this kind of 
political uh, helicopter parenting. You know, politics were taking care of us that we would not smoke and they would warn us uh, that also alcohol is not healthy to us. And, and when there would be some sex on television, they would warn us before that this is now adult language and it could hurt our feelings and so on. And in a way, I thought uh, this is uh, a kind of strange politics that in a way suggests us if we behave nicely, then we will live forever. So death is just a kind of occurrence, uh, a punishment for bad behavior. And if we follow and always obey, then we can live peacefully forever. No? And I think this, and this was a consideration based following certain lines of the philosopher Georges Bataille, that this makes us servants. When, when we only serve life and we only act in order to preserve our life and only do what we do in order to maintain life, then we come, become the slaves of life. And Bataille said uh, we must in some moments like speak to life like uh, equals and say to life, listen life, now I have worked five days a week for you, but now I want something back from you. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now it's Saturday, now uh, life should be here for me. Yeah? And, uh, and that, in a way, has a political sense. If you act like this, and if you think like this, and if you say, what is it actually that I want to do on Saturday, and how could life give me something back, and not only make me serve it, then uh, you are not only able to enjoy life, uh, but you will also be able not to be a slave uh, to politics. And this is, in a way, the lesson, I think, also that Bertolt Brecht has been kept teaching, for example, in his poem, Resolution of the Communards, uh, where he lets the Communards of Paris say to their enemies, uh, now that uh, you are threatening us with guns and cannons, we have decided that from now on we will fear bad life more than death. Uh, if we are not able at some point to say that, yeah, if we say we are now de being deprived of what life is worth living for, then they can do anything with us. If we, uh, this is, I think, the ethical point of political resistance to say, yeah, but what is life for? What is it life for? We do not have to have an immediate answer, but the sovereignty of our attitude proves itself by the fact that we ask this question and that we do not silence it. This is about standing. <laughs> Anyone else? Maybe to add something? No? It was so good? Especially the last words. <laughs> That's uh, a very good ending, I think. <laughs> you are really welcome to join us in 20 minutes here. Marina Herlop will be on stage from Spain. Very interesting group. Good music and afterwards also Bill Kalgas. And I really thank to you, Robert Fader and Mladen Dolar. It was a great, great evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>